this chapter, chapter nine, individual decision making. It's a process. Yes, it starts with problem recognition, it proceeds to information search, then we evaluate the alternatives, then we choose a product or a solution, and then we experience outcomes. No surprise here, but the process is not always quite that simple or as rational as that process might explore, as might, might indicate. In fact, um, it makes me think of a, a story, Frederick the Great, the, known as the Potato King. Look on my Twitter feed for the link. The, uh, the story is this, about 300 years ago, the king, you know, it's, it's Prussia and, and they were facing starvation, or at least food supply was an issue, so the king wanted to feed his people and he discovered this food called potatoes. Um, and he preached to the folks that, you know, everybody should eat potatoes, he made potatoes available, the people didn't like being told what, what to eat, and, and they didn't eat them. So this is where the brilliance of consumer behavior and Frederick the Great in particular comes in. He's thinking about this, what's he going to do? He decides, he, he plants a potato field outside the palace, and he, he barricades it. He puts, you know, walls around it, and he posts guards, but he tells the guards not to be, not to be too vigilant, and you know, if people try and sneak in to let them. And of course, the people who are used to poaching on <laughs> King's lands, you know, say, this must be special. He's locking it up. It's just for him. Why should it just be for him? Let's go, let's go try this. And people would sneak in and steal potatoes. And of course, that spreads. So then they get word of mouth. Hey, these potatoes are really good. I stole them from the king. And so on and so forth. And uh, in the end, of course, potatoes became very popular and the king achieved his goal. As you can probably guess by now, you know, buying decision behavior doesn't happen the same way all the time. It varies. There's, the book talks about a continuum of decision-making behavior where you have routine at one end, you know, for low-cost products, frequent purchasing, stuff you do every day. Um, then there's some limited problem solving for the products that are somewhere in the middle. Maybe you've never bought it before, but it's something that, uh, you know, it's, for instance, when you move out of home, you're going to have to buy things like detergent. What detergent are you going to buy? Um, probably will buy whatever your mom bought, but then again, you might be on a severe budget and buy the cheapest possible. So uh, there'd be some pro some problem solving going on in there, but nothing nothing real big. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have very extensive problem solving, where the products are more expensive. There's a high involvement, a high personal involvement. Uh, you don't buy them very often. There's a lot of risk associated and that sort of thing. So the next few the next few slides, we're going to sort of step through the the, the, the parts of the uh, decision making process. Uh, which begins with problem recognition. So does, how does the, how does the uh, consumer, how does Charlie recognize that he has a problem and that, that he should solve it? And, you know, the, the basic theory here is that there's, there's an actual state that you're in and there's a, there's a desired state that you're in where you want to be. And when that gap gets big enough, the problem is recognized. Once we have a problem, a recognized problem, then uh, Charlene needs to go out and search. She, there's a search phase. So we, it's internal. We think about, you know, what have, what's been my experience with this product or this product category, or what can I do? What shall I eat is, of course, the classic one, you know. My stomach's grumbling. There's a, there's a variance between where I am hungry and where I want to be full. And uh, I, I recognize that, so I search my brain and say, what, would, what do I feel like eating? Or where do I feel like going? Uh, there's also the idea of an external search. You know, I might hit the old Google, of course. I might uh, talk to friends, relatives, call somebody up and say, hey, what was that restaurant you were talking about? Which is kind of interesting in that there's this idea of deliberate search where I actually hit Google and I'm, I'm looking for it. And then there's sort of the accidental search where I come across something, either either a display, an outdoor, uh, when I'm out and about, I'll run, run across something. Hey, there's a new restaurant. I saw there's a new restaurant. Um, that, that clues me in. And, um, you know, I think this also highlights the importance of something that I'm not sure you're getting enough on in this program yet called SEO or search engine optimization. Um, we're not going to get into it right here, but it definitely should be part of your strategy if you include the internet. We have search and the involvement of the, the process, the how extensive the decision making process is, depends uh, to some degree, at least on the degree of perceived risk. And the book chats about five, it doesn't chat, it has a diagram, a, a, a table. Uh, buyer is most sensitive to risk, purchase is most sensitive to risk, subject to risk, and then, you know, the five types of risks and a little bit of discussion on them. You know, obviously how much something costs, uh, whether it's going to do the job or not, the functional risk, physical risk, is it going to hurt me? Um, and, you know, that, that comes into foods and stuff, doesn't have high sodium content, for instance. Uh, the social risk of using it, eating spam is, you know, generally considered either good or bad, depending upon your, your reference groups, which we're going to get into shortly. Uh, and of course, the psychological risk or the physiological risk. Psychological risk, sorry, not physiological, psychological. 
So the next step in our process, we've recognized the problem, we've done some search, now it's about identifying alternatives. And, and what comes up here is this evoked set. So the evoked set is what internally I have. I need a new pair of running shoes. What brands do I think of? Oh, that's the evoked set. I also may go, may, may go searching and add to that evoked set with new brands, but the, the, the objective for us as advertisers is to be in that evoked set. So when somebody first thinks about, I need new shoes, who do you think about? In the, uh, the sort of the evaluation process, we put things in categories, right? We say, oh, this is a this is a this is a good quality. This is a bad quality. This is an intermediate quality. This is a throwaway. Um, yeah. So we categorize. Categorization is important for us because a category of something goes with positioning. So you know, if we're positioning our product as a high-end, expensive, elitist type of thing, you really don't want people putting it in the garbage bin, in their mind. That is. So how do we evaluate? Um, and this, uh, this again, we're sort of following this path and assuming that we're doing things in a reasonably rational way and it's not purely emotional, which does happen. So, you know, every purchase decision doesn't, doesn't take this path. But, you know, assuming we are going through it, you know, we, we sort of assemble our options. What are our options? And think about them. You know, you might, we might even go to the extent of creating sort of a pros and cons. Our prior existence with similar products is going to come in, you know, the information at time of purchase, what do we have, um, and our beliefs about the brands, in fact, uh, which may come from advertising, and that's something that we can practice. Yeah, the book talks about heuristics. Heuristics is a great word. Um, it's, and in this case, it's mental rules of thumb that lead to a speedy decision. Um, sometimes they can be wrong, but if we can fit into, you know, this idea of the book uses the example of higher price equals higher quality, whatever, whatever the heuristic is, whatever the rule of thumb that our consumer is applying, um, if we can find some way of attaching ourselves to that, then it would be good. Brand loyalty obviously plays a big role in uh, in the decision making. In fact, one of the one of the big benefits to brands in terms of our our sort of cognitive uh, space is that they allow us to shorten the decision making process. We don't have to rethink it every time because you know, imagine if every time you went out, your bar of soap was a different brand, and uh, and you couldn't buy the same brand. Then once you found one which you liked, you know, you'd never be able to get back to it. That would be that would be bad. The book has a hypothetical alternatives for a TV set chart that sort of lays out how, how a logical person might evaluate the alternatives for a TV set with attributes on one side, the attributes are weighted, and uh, then you know you, you, each column is, is your brand and you determine which brand meets the, meets the attributes the best. That concludes chapter 9. Coming up soon, chapter 10.